Welcome everyone. So I think we can start. Okay, in today's uh, lecture, we are going to cover uh, disease spreading modelings, and uh, which is very closely related to your homework yesterday. Can uh, you confirm in the chat that you can hear me clearly and see my slides? Yes, perfect. Yes. So, okay. Let's get started. So this, we uh, we can start by uh, reviewing the homework you, you made yesterday. So this is a, like, a, uh, th this was the first homework you did, so it's very, uh nice that most of you did quite nice codes and it was mostly clear easy to read uh when i looked at your codes it looked like you knew what you were doing uh, however there are always places that you can improve and uh, in, especially in terms of syntax and notation not maybe uh, in terms of efficiency but i i know for sure that there were students that had problems with efficiency also so they did not have enough time to run the code so we maybe talk about those things also now that we we can talk about how uh, you can improve in, uh, in these things when you are programming the next homeworks or any other project for future reference. Uh, before I start, is, is there anyone who wants to ask a question about the homework? So I hope that all of you have an idea about the structure of grading now so that uh, next time uh, we will be more organized it was uh, a few of you that were a bit uh, we were a bit behind the schedule especially around lunchtime but it went all smooth and we were on time at the end so it was nice okay so i want to start with the demonstration of a of an example code that i made and can you see my screen of the yeah we, we see it okay i mean the code not the presentation now yeah it's okay code. perfect perfect so here i will show you some and I, I i let you know that i'm going to share this code after the lecture so i will put it inside the folder homework one so you can download and use it uh if you if you need something if you are primarily matlab user you can uh, uh get inspired from this one i this one is written in python i may also upload a version that is matlab but that's uh, slightly more primitive that i have a version that i had written earlier in matlab so this is more interactive and you can also change parameters in real time so and the one important thing is that this is an agent based version so it, we, i don't really keep the numbers of agents in each lattice grid uh, which we actually recommended in the homework but for the purpose of this this file i i prepared it in agent based format simply for two reasons one it will help you more to understand some shortcuts in programming especially many of you i realize don't know how to do it and two this is going to be a, a part of a book that we are writing that will cover uh, simulations of complex systems so any feedback you can also give up uh, give give back on this on this uh, homework file uh, like the code piece of code would be very helpful so let's go ahead and run this one. So when I run this one, it starts the simulation. As you can see, the agents move. And uh, uh, you can also play with this a lot. So you can play with uh, the diffusion probability. If I decrease it so much, you see that they stop moving. If you can increase it, and then you see all of them are moving at each time step. Or you can put it around 50%. So at any time step, only half of them roughly move. And you can play with the infection probability. If you put it zero, you will see that they are not increasing. It is you can see there are a number of infected agents here that are only decreasing. And I can increase it, and then I immediately start to see that this number is going up. So 
that is also working. You can also play with recovery rate. You can put it to zero. You will see that no new agents will be recovered and you can put it to 0.1, for example, which is a very high recovery rate that will result in shortly recovery of all the agents. So, so you can all, always uh, set the parameters that you want to observe and then you can uh, click restart and it will start restarting until you shut this window down. In that case, the simulation is going to be forced to stop. So I, I highly recommend you can uh, you go and check out this one and play with it to more to understand. I don't know how many of you had the code that you can quickly play with the parameters and see what is actually going on. But it's a it's a it's a in general a good rule of thumbs that you have a system that you can visualize what you are doing. You can realize a lot of mistakes you're making on the go. So if you are seeing what the mistake is, if it's somewhere in the code, somewhere in the variable, you have a bug it may take you very long to debug. So it's, you need to really look at the system that is what's going on. It might be very helpful in most cases. So here you can see that, of course, I spent a little bit of uh, time in designing this interface that one can change the parameters, which is a, a very fundamental package in Python that is called pkinter. And uh, if for those of you who are familiar with the, with the package, it's probably included in in the base python version so you don't need to uh, download or uh, install any packages so you just need to run this code and it should run smoothly and i spent some time designing the outline and the buttons and the scales that i can and the sliders for parameters i i use and then i i, I initiate my parameters what i do is that i i keep three arrays fundamentally that will help me understand the system at any state. One is an array of X. So this, this is a one dimensional array that has length N, if N is my number of agents. And I keep another array that is that I call Y, which is the Y positions of all my agents. This is also a 1D array. And then I keep a further array that I call S. This has the same structure. This has N elements in it. It's a 1D array. And this is a status array. So here, uh, uh, zero, if an element is zero in this array, it means that that agent is susceptible. It's not sick yet. If it's one, it means that it's infected. If it's two, it means that it has recovered. So I keep all necessary information in three simple arrays. So I don't really need any other thing for the, for the sake of this simulation. I hope you can agree with that. I, I see that most of you have done something quite similar, but uh, what, I will sh what I want to focus on here is that the shortcuts you can have to, uh, to first uh, optimize better your code, and second, it will be much easier to read in the future when you, when you go back. For example, if I go back to this code in one year, I will understand without any problems at one read what I have done here. I ask you something really quick about yes. Uh, how come you multiply? Is that do you multiply a, a random number with one there, or is or no? It's an L. Oh, sorry. Where where are you referring to? Uh, in the argument of uh, yeah, L, uh, is a, L is a uh, length like lattice size. I I just you can play with these parameters here. So it's always good that you put them in the in the beginning of your simulation. So if you want to just change time. I see a lot of people sometimes writing the step inside every 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 line of code, and when they change the size, they need to go back in every line and change it manually. So you should never do that. You should always uh, put here all the parameters you can need, and then refer to them as you as you proceed in the code. This is L. So an agent can be. Uh, so th this is actually for for getting integer numbers. Because if I don't get in integer numbers, I cannot really check if they are at the same lattice side or not. The numbers won't be equal, so it will be difficult to comp compare. And uh, I just generate some random numbers between zero and one and multiply this by the lattice size. This give me, gives me random numbers from zero to lattice size. And then I just take a uh, flo floor, which gives me uh, numbers in terms of uh, integers. So, and then I generate in the beginning that are uh, that all the agents susceptible, 
and then I check. Uh, so what I do here is that I make a sorting and I get the index of the sorted distances of the agents to the center. And then I get, I have a parameter that is initially infected that indicates how many agents are initially infected. And I get this, uh, so I put this, uh, I, I don't know if I can explain very shortly what I'm doing here, but I highly recommend you try to understand, for example, what is done here. Because it's very, uh, uh, something you, if you get used to this notation, you can write things much shorter in your code and much, much more efficiently. And it will be much easier to read. So what I get here is I is the indexes of the sorted uh, uh, agents according to their distance to the center. So if I, if I take after this SI, this will give me status of each in agent that, is, uh, that will be sorted in terms of their distance to center because here I put the argument that is the distance to the center. And then I just take the first initial infected elements of these indices and then pass it to my uh, uh, status array. And then I change those ones to one. So essentially I make uh, my agents that are closer to sentence, uh, center, uh, I change them to sick. So this is how the simulation is initialized. And I also pass the same function to, to the restart button. So that if I click on this restart button, it, it, will, it will do the same and it will just make uh, everyone susceptible except the ones that are closer to the middle. And then this is something that I need for using this. Uh, I am using something called Canvas module to, to, to plot the agents kind of and update them. Because if I use matplot library, it's a little bit slower than what I'm using here. That is why I, I generate my objects, my, my plots as objects here, and then I update them. I use a move function, so I don't really recreate them each time. So these are minor details. You don't really necessarily need to pay attention to this part. Anything that is canvas or, yeah, anything that is canvas or TK uh, based in this code, you don't need to understand them for the, for the fundamental part of the code. And then this is my loop and this is all I do. So it's all these lines. You see from line 68 to 77, I, and I don't call any external function to run the code. So this is all it's doing. What I do is that I first take a, a random numbers between zero and one, the same number as the number of particles. This will be my decision random numbers for each particle, if they are going to move or not. And then if they're smaller than uh, D divided by two, I, I tell this, these are my particles that will move along X. And if they are between D divided by two and D, I tell, myself that these are my particles that will move along y and i simply need to get a also coefficient of plus or minus one how does there is a question how does the code handle several agents at the same position so since this code is agent based so i am keeping locations of all the agents so are you, uh, is your question re, uh, referring to the infection or movement of the agents? Status array, yes, we will come to that. We will come to that. Yeah, okay, so we have a status array, but we will come to that. So at this point, we, we generate also further plus or minus one for each agent, and then I multiply this by uh, steps X and steps Y uh, variables that I generated. This creates a, actually a Boolean array, but when I multiply it by minus one or plus one, NumPy uh, deals it internally so that it goes, it will be transferred to either minus one and plus one. And I put this, this is a remainder function built in in Python that is uh, just making sure that my, I have proper boundary conditions. In this case, uh, I have, uh, uh, periodic boundary conditions. If I would need to apply a solid boundary conditions, I would just remove this one. So let's say, so instead of writing this way, I can just write, 
I would remove this remainder function and I would add another line. I would say nx is equal to mp minimum and then I would put here first nx and then like uh, times x max. So I am kind of limiting my function to be smaller than, a, than or equal to x max. This would be equivalent to a solid boundary condition. So I first move all my particles and then I pull back kind of, I also need to of course do it in the other boundary. That is the, that is the, on the left side. This is for the right side. And for the left side, I should take maximum values of nx and uh, this should be x minimum. Is this clear? I hope this is clear. But for the sake of this simulation, I'm not doing this. I'm applying a periodic boundary condition. So here is the most critical part. So I want to check each agent. And uh, if they are infected, they have a chance to infect others. So here I have to have at least one for loop because I have to check each infected agent. So this is the only place where I use a for loop. And what I do is that so I loop some indexes for the status array. So I want to find out the indexes of my agents that are going to infect others. What is the condition that my agent can infect others? There are two conditions. They should satisfy the probability. So I generate random numbers that has the same amount of length of my array. And then I check if it's smaller than the, than the infection rate. And then I have another condition that my agent, in order to be infect, to be able to infect others, it should it has to be sick to, from the beginning. So I put an end operator, and this gives me uh, true or false for each agent. True indicating that that agent is going to infect others. False indicating that agent is not going to infect others. And then what I do is I get indices of these by mpware function, and then I, I loop, I, I pass it to a, a variable i, and I, I, I make a for loop over this i. And then here inside, now I need to decide which uh, agents are going to be infected from each infecting agent. So for an agent to be, to be, able, to be able to get infected from a sick agent, they have to be sitting in the same x lattice side, that gives me this one and they have to be sitting in the same y lattice side and they have to be susceptibles so i can pass all these things in one uh, in in one operation with connecting these three conditions with ends and then this will give me trues and fal falses and then i can pass it further this into my susceptible array so this will automatically choose those indices that uh, my agents that are going to be infected and I change their status to one. So I highly recommend. Okay, there is a question. Uh, what is the index zero at the end of line 74? Okay, so I need to make a very short. So let's say uh, I have a uh, 10 random variables and I check them if they are smaller than 0.5. I get this array of trues and falses and I want to get the arrays of uh, uh, which one of these ones are true. I can use this function mpvar. This will give me, this will return to me first the indices of true values and then the second, this will return me the data type. I don't need the data type for, for this. So that's why I indicate zero here. So this will give me back the indices of, uh, sorry, wait. If I use this one, it will give me a list. So the first element of this list, actually, I don't know why Python works this way, but it just gives me a list that is this array first. And then uh, I need to further indicate that it's i want to the first element although there is only one element in the in the list i need to index that to get it i hope this answers it's something re related to 
Yes, exactly. It's a tuple with only one element. That's a more precise description. So, so that's why I need this zero here. Anyway, I highly recommend you understand. You can do something very similar in MATLAB in a very, very easy way, and you can deal with it in two lines. You just pour over all the infected agents. And I, when I want to check if an agent is recovery, I don't need a for loop. I can, what are the conditions for, for someone to be able to recover? First, they need to be sick. I put that condition S is equal equal one. And then I make it use an end operator and connect it to the fact that they have to satisfy the probability condition to be to, to recover, which is their random number should be smaller than uh, the recovery coefficient. And if they satisfy both conditions, they recover and their status is updated. So this way I can really write all my pandemic uh, related uh, codes in three lines. So I, I summarize everything and it's easy to follow and understand. Importantly, I generate all my random numbers at once in a for loop. What would be even more efficient is that you can design, pre-design pre these random numbers outside of the for loop even, you before, even before you start the simulation. But that may not be uh, uh, necessary for this, for the purpose of at least this simulation. And then I just, the rest is just plotting them and moving them correctly in this, in this uh, interface that I designed and then just up, up, updating. And then you can see that it's running uh, quite smoothly in real time. Of course, if I have, uh, the problem is that you, this is uh, quite efficient, but if I have more agents, it will take more time to move each agent. You can see that this is running a little bit slowly. The reason is not that the simulation itself is slow here, it's that really the, it takes a lot of time for the computer, for my computer at least, to update this interface with all these elements. So it's not the simulation that is being slow here, but the, uh, but the plotting of it. And uh, I am not, uh, if anyone has a, uh, recommendation of how to speed up this update of the plotting, I, it would be very welcome for me actually, as a side note. So is there any questions about this representation? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Yes. So there on line 77, you use uh, logical indexing, right? Yes, exactly. And the Python, is, is, does that work in the same way as MATLAB as it sort of knows automatically that you're using logical indexing? Yes, so you can put, uh, so if you have an array that has n elements and you are passing a logical array that has trues or falses of size n, uh, uh, then it is, uh, it use, it is working uh, from what I have seen, the same as, a, as MATLAB. Okay, great, thanks. Like, like this way. And uh, of course, the Python has a, sometimes you need to use, uh, in MATLAB, it's a little bit more uh, intuitive, I would say, like uh, if you have an, if you're having an integer, you don't need to specify that is an integer sometimes to use it as an index, but in Python it does. But for this logical array case, it works quite smoothly that you can put arguments here and then index your array with it, it's no problem. So something like if I have x is equal to mp, this is a classical example I always. So I, I generate some something that is, uh, let's, let's say this one, and then I print my array. You can always do like uh, x, uh, let me see. So you, if you want to just only choose those elements in the x that is uh, greater than some element, so X, you can just write this way, and this is gonna work. You see that the first array is just random numbers between zero and one. And then the, the second one, I can just use this notation also in Python to, to address those, those elements in my array that are greater than a certain value or anything that is uh, satisfying a condition I can put here. And you can always put, as I do here, multiple conditions inside the indexing brackets, and uh, you will get those elements only. And what you can do is, for example, I can say that if all these elements that are greater than one, I change them to zero. And in this case, 
I can print again, you see that this will change all the elements that are greater than 0.5 to zero. So if you want to, if you only want to operate on certain elements that satisfy certain conditions, this way of uh, indexing is very useful. If efficiency is con constrained by the library you're using, you could add another slider that allows you to specify how, how open to update the graphics, I guess. Yes, I agree totally with people that are recommending that uh, we don't, uh, I don't need to update them every step. I agree, but uh, it, uh, for the, this particular simulation, I, I, I want to see them every step because it provides a smooth visual. I mean, if, if you don't, if you're not dealing with a lot of agents, it's quite smooth anyway. And for, to be able to understand, also keep it always in mind that you can have a smaller size simulation to begin with. This applies to everything for the second homework, for the third homework, for the fourth homework. When you start understanding things, try from smaller simulation. If I were to simulate this one from the beginning, I would just put 10 patients in a very small lattice size just to understand if things work. And then I can always scale things up. This will be very useful for the second and the third homework specifically. If you understand, for example, if something is not working properly here, there is no way in this mass of thousand particles that I can follow what is being wrong. If a particle is being in the same location with susceptibles and not infected them correctly, or if a boundary condition doesn't work, I cannot see it easily here because there are a thousand particles and all of them moving. It's looking like a mess. If you have a temp particle in the beginning, it will be much easier for you to see what's going wrong with your code. If something is wrong, it's very useful for debugging. Okay, so anyone else having a question about this code? So I hope, uh, I noticed there is plenty of people that were able to use this kind of notation for, for changing array elements according to certain conditions. But I hope this will help uh, uh, quite a few students to, to understand how can they operate with less for loops and if loops. So you see that I don't have any if condition at all here. My if conditions are hidden inside. So this is an if condition, this is another if condition, this is another if condition. But I don't really need to write those conditions because this way I save the space. Okay. So is there any more questions about this related to homework one? Anything you want to add or ask? Okay, great. Then. Uh, we can go back to simulation uh, to, to, to the presentation. So are you, you all seeing my presentation again? How long was your running time for question four? Okay, I did not calculate my run time for, uh, for this particular task, but I can show you that if I don't plot them, so I can cancel this part of the code. And I can maybe print the time here. And I wait five seconds. And I see how many steps I have been. So you see it has been to 7,000 steps. So it's going pretty fast. So if a simulation is going to be even taking 100,000 steps, it will be done uh, fairly quickly, I would say in a minute. And if I, if I have to rerun the simulation 20 times, 30 times, it will, it will not take more than half an hour or an hour for, for running all the cases, if that answers your question. Of course, this was for 800 particles. You can increase that and you can, it's not gonna take more than two hours by any means. I hope this answers the question. By the way, I am not uh, claiming that this is the most efficient way of, of simulating these. 
I, 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 uh, one might argue that one can make these operations much faster in a simpler notation. I'm not sure if in Python, but in, in C you can make them faster. But of course, uh, this allows me to write things much easier. This brings me to another point that you need to optimize your time optimizing the code plus the running time of the code. This is something very fundamental a lot of people have problems in. So there are three types of programmers in like, in, in a, like programming strategy in a project. First, you program something very simple that you know that is going to work. A lot of for loops, a lot of ifs, conditions, you know it's, it's gonna work and you don't think about efficiency. That might take very long to run. And then the second approach is that you do a decent optimization for a while. You think about a little bit how to optimize your code and then you let the computer run. And then the third way is that you spend a lot of time in optimizing your code and then at the end you, you run your code. It runs very quickly, but you have spent so much time optimizing your code. So the idea, I, idea here is that to opti to, to minimize the total amount of time that you optimize the code and then you run the code. So this is also very important in, in your project. So you can always work for, think about for years how you can optimize further. Maybe it will run uh, uh, half a day instead of one day. But if you are spending two days on that, it's kind of uh, not ideal. You always think about your computer's time is less valuable than your time. I don't know if that is, uh, that makes sense to all of you. Of course, at this stage of when you're taking a course about how do you simulate systems, you want to be able to learn as uh, how to make a code as efficient as possible. But this refers to later projects maybe when you are doing uh, in your life, real life, you need to optimize your time the total time that will you optimize the code and your running time so this took me very short time to program so i don't really mind if it's taking slightly longer than what is what can be ideal i don't actually believe you can do something much faster than this in python anyway but i am pretty sure uh, there are some uh, students here from computer science background which is not my background can make this more efficient definitely Okay, so we go back to the presentation. Can you confirm in the chat, please, that you see my presentation screen now? Yes, great. So, okay. So, so these things, why do we simulate uh, a, 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 a pandemic dynamics? This was uh, a very much more difficult motivation last year because maybe students didn't think this was as important after uh, a big pandemic hit uh, which is the coronavirus so that now it became actually particularly re relevant in this course we have had this case for for a few years now in the in the homeworks but uh, maybe previous years it was not as interested but it's actually not the first pandemic that we are observing it's pretty common that some some new virus uh, comes out and creates a big pandemic either locally in a country or globally. This is a simple, uh, an example of the Great Plague in London. You can see it was uh, a lot of people, especially considering they all are from one city. And uh, you can also see here a, a, a sample uh, uh, plot of uh, massless in, in New York City. Here, in, it's plotted against cases, actually. And then uh, you see that the, these things can be, can be repeated over time. So you see that uh, the deaths, actually, the virus disappears for a while, and then it comes back, and it disappears for a while, and it comes back. And you can see that also some, some diseases are just uh, sometimes keep re repeating every other year, which we also see and observe from the coronavirus case that we have. So what we have used so far is the simplest SIR model. What is SIR model? It is susceptible, infected, and recovered. So this was uh, uh, proposed long ago. So this is the simplest, this is known as the simplest modeling of, of uh, 
uh, of a di disease spreading. So here we have a susceptible family, which uh, is decreasing as people get infected. And the most important equation here is the second equation. That is the equation that dis describes how infected number of agents change. So here you see that di divided by dt is equal to beta, which is the, the infection coefficient times susceptibles. So if there are more susceptibles, you can uh, infect more people per, per time step. And then the number of infected agents, of course, if you have, if you are, if you have more infected agents, you infect more people uh, per time unit. And then this is uh, new here is the recovery coefficient and then minus recovery coefficient times the infected agents. So of course, if you have more infected agents, the more they will recover also. And then there is the recovered agents, which is only the, the it can only be increasing from the infected agents that become recovered. So this looks very simple compared to what we observe in real time, because here it's not even considered in the original model that we have agents and they are going. This is set of equations this disregards so many things. This, they disregard stochasticity. There is no stochasticity in these equations. There is no role of probability. There is no role of agent. So there is no role of diffusion, which is uh, also a, an important disregard. And uh, there is no role uh, of immunity, social measures, treatment, or quarantine. So none of these things are considered in these equations. But yet, it's a very, it was a very powerful model in the beginning. So it, it, it was able to describe most of the situations that people were observing at the time. So this is an important example for your projects also. So you have to think in this way that you simplify the world in, in, in your project, right? You have a very complicated system. Let's say you want to uh, simulate some system. It can be an ecosystem, it can be a, a economical system, it can be anything that you are trying in your project. You need to simplify that, but you, you need to get the fundamentals right. What these equations did was getting the fundamentals right. And it's really, really straightforward to think about. And, uh, but it worked and it, was, uh, it has been still the most commonly used model. What we have added in our homework to this is only the diffusion. So we don't consider all of them together. We just consider all of them as in individual agents and they can only affect each other if they are uh, close to each other or at the same place. Is it clear so far what I have taught? Okay, so this is another, uh, so we, people want to make models and this is, so the, we start here, we have a real wor world problem. And then we simplify assumptions and we have a simplified version of this. It may look really oversimplified at, for some models, but if it can uh, uh, reflect some of the real world consequences, it can be considered as a successful model. And then you go to modeling, you create model, and then you, you try your model with a lot of different parameters. And then you check your scenarios and then you decide if this model was successful or not. So you, you, you try to see the outputs of your model uh, with a lot of different parameters and you can decide if this model is going to reflect the real world outcomes or not. If these things make sense or not. This is the cycle. If it's not making sense, you have to go through another simplification for your model. You need to design, okay, maybe we need to consider this also. We need to consider this parameter and we need to consider this parameter. And then you uh, start from simple, getting more and more complicated and try to reproduce the real world outcomes that you see in, in a problem. So this is the cycle and uh, we are going to see in the, we can have a break now and we can start at 11 to, to, to discuss how we actually, how people actually did this for, for, for SIR models. So how people make, made it more and more complicated and a little bit more information about uh, disease spreading models. And we will also discuss how it relates to the recent coronavirus and how 
uh, further modeling and approaches can be made to understand these kind of pandemics. So is there any questions? We can now answer them. Otherwise, we can have a break. So any questions so far? Okay, then I guess we can have a break now and we continue at 11 on uh, on uh, uh, more comprehensive models on uh, on disease spreading. If you have any questions during the break, you can write it in the chat. So when we come back, we can look at them also. Questions about homework too? Yes, you can write questions about homework too, and we can discuss them in the break actually, if you have any questions. What is meant by use the theoretical model of drawing straight lines? So what you do is that you take first few points and assign a slope to them, make a fitting to a first, so Often what you observe in this homework is that the power uh, rank frequency plots start linear going down in log log scale, of course, and then they kind of deviate from the initial pattern or initial uh, 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 way of going down of your data that is kind of linear. So you just you can just fit it to the linear part and make a line and show that how it's deviating from that line. I hope that answers your question. see there are more questions so in one are you supposed to get the fire size let me just stop the share screen and then look at the go to homework and you can address better what you're asking <clears throat> let's see Okay, so you can also see in the first plot actually what they mean by drawing a line. So you, 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 you get the first few points and then you draw a straight line fitting to it. And then you see how the rest is uh, deviating from that. And then let's see. Mm. Are we supposed to get the fire size in one? Let me see. Okay. 
So for the first part of the homework, you are supposed to generate four different figures uh, showing four different cases. So you change your parameters and generate four different figures of a sample snapshot of the model when there is a fire. So you show that, for example, uh, the model is more clustered and there is a big fire. With another parameters, the model is more dispersed away. The clusters of trees and there are small fires. And uh, maybe one model where a lot of lightnings and the uh, growth rate is low. So there is only very small clusters of trees. So you want, I, we want you to show a few different uh, snapshots of the model according to different parameters. So you, so you need to prepare four pictures with four uh, set of parameters. So it's very good if you plot the parameters on top of pictures. So when I look at the picture, for example, I can immediately see if this makes sense or not. And then there is the second part. So we, we study the distribution of fires. So the second part, you need to record the sizes of the fires. Let me go back to the question. We are supposed to calculate the density of what? Okay, you are supposed to calculate, first of all, record the sizes of fire. And then you are going to create cumulative uh, complementary distribution function versus the fire size. This means that if x axis is, let's say, 10, y axis is pr the probability that you have a fire greater than 10. This is what you plot. So if, but of course you plot this in log log scale. So if x axis your value, if a fire is, uh, if x axis is 100, your fire size is 100, your corresponding complementary cumulative distribution function value is the uh, probability that a fire is lar was larger than 100 for that specific uh, set of fires that you uh, obtain from your simulations. There is another question from Anita. Shall we determine the exponent by computing the linear regression of the curve in the rank frequency plot? Yes. So what you need to do is just you need to make a linear fitting, not necessarily the all, to all of the data, but you can make that judgment yourself. It's not a big problem if you make it a little bit this way or this way, but you try to pick as many points as you can while it was linear. So, so a line can go this way and then go deviate from its linear behavior. Okay, there are more questions coming. I just need to buy something. Okay, so there is another question, let's see. Is it right to say that at each time step, we first have new trees growing, then the lightning spark, then we see how many trees it burns, and then we eliminate those trees and start again from that distribution of trees at the next time instant. That, that yes, this sounds exactly like what we asked for. So for the four figures, we could just consider a single step with different parameters every time and plotting the situ situation where the trees are burning before eliminating them. Yes. But one important thing is that you need to first run the simulation for a while for a certain number of parameters. So it can, it has seen uh, a number of fire events already, ideally a thousand, maybe a hundred. And then you take a snapshot because if you don't do that, you don't see the density of the forest naturally grown with those parameters of lightning strikes and the growth rate. I hope this answers the question.
Okay, so there is a question from Arthur. Could 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 there be multiple lightnings occurring during a run? I would say uh, it's simpler if you can just make one lightning during a run. And if it's hitting on a tree, it starts a fire. If it's not hitting on a tree, it doesn't start a fire. And you can burn all of them together in one, one step if they are connected. This will give you all the results you need. You don't need to complicate your life. Of course, you can also design a model where the fire is spreading at each time step. But then it might be very difficult to define the fire size. The problem there is that there might be multiple fires growing together. And then you don't really know how you really define the fire size. If you have one lightning and then it burns them all at one time step, that will make your life easy because you know your fire size. How many trees burned? 60. That's my fire size. Okay. Great. If you have more questions, you can write it in the chat and uh, we can have a look at them before maybe the beginning of the lecture. see here can someone please confirm that you can hear me and you can see the slides yes great so we were we had stopped here before so this was uh, so we now in this lecture are going to talk about more complicated pandemic models that are based on SIR model, but they include a lot more parameters than what SIR actually ignores. So, so the first thing that one can think of adding to the SIR model is exposure. So we, I, I think you all are familiar with this idea that you can always have, um, have caught the, the virus but you have not really uh, showing symptoms yet. So you cannot be classified as an infected person. So this gives usually some kind of incubation time of the virus in your body before it actually expresses its, uh, its symptoms on your body. So this can be added. And then of course, uh, depending on the type of the virus, this exposed population can or cannot infect other people depending on different kinds of uh, situations. Uh, and also uh, another thing is that can be added, it gets particularly relevant, especially for the pandemic that we are observing this year, is the temporary immunity that everyone is talking about. So it, may, it doesn't have to be in a model that someone is recovered, that has to be recovered forever. Immunity might be temporary. In fact, most of the vaccines that we are taking in our lives, including that, uh, for example, the tetanus or rabies, some of them can last for a very long time, but uh, they most of them have a time that you need to repeat it. For example, a very common one that we people often take in Sweden is the TBD vaccine, so tick-borne diseases. So you have to take it quite often. So first time you take it, I think you need to take it in another month, and then you need to take it in another year. So you uh, uh, push your immunity system that your, your, your immunity persists for a longer time period. Because uh, if people uh, stop being immune, then it may happen that the virus is going to spread again. And then there is uh, 
another further uh, parameter that you can include is asymptomatic cases. So this is also very common for most influenza family uh, pandemics that a, a sickness might be very detrimental on a certain society, certain group of people, and it may be barely observable in another population. This may depend on gender, this may depend on age, this may depend on your pre-existing health conditions, or this may depend on many different things. So in this case, some of the part of the population will be sick and uh, showing the symptoms so they can identify themselves sick and they can be identified that they're sick so they can be tested and stuff. But some other population is not so easy to identify that they are sick or even get tests to identify that they're sick. And they might be even having no idea that they have had the disease, but uh, they were actually sick. So the, another example to this can be um, the number of cases in coronaviruses. For example, in April, there were lots of people dying every day. However, the number of cases were not so high. This may be because of a lot more people were actually sick, but they were not reported because they were not aware of the fact that they were sick. Also that there were not as many tests being, being done at the time compared to today. And also uh, uh, the models we have considered so far also in the homework is we don't really consider, we haven't really considered mortality. So uh, a disease, of course, if it's uh, uh, virus-based, it may cause mortality. It, uh, the, not everybody's immune system may be able to fight the virus, especially if they are uh, old and their body is weak, or they have pre-existing conditions that uh, make them particularly difficult to fight against the virus. So some people might uh, end up uh, being defeated by the virus. So all these cases can be described as generalized cases to, to what we know as a simple SIR model. And you can always include more uh, parameters, like you can always include quarantine, you can include uh, treatment. For example, if you include treatment, you can have, you can say that uh, you can put people in the treatment region and then a category and then move people and you can include uh, limited treatment or unlimited treatment if you have a limited number of resources to to treat people uh, you can you can call it limited for example in in some countries it might it has been a problem for the corona cases that they run out of hospital units so they couldn't really reach everyone so all of these things uh, can be added on top of the uh, SRI, SIR model. But you see that all of these mo models have one thing in common, which is they are based on SIR. This shows us how successful the original SIR model is, although it was extremely simple. Are there any questions about these uh, different models? Anything that is not clear? Okay, then we can move on. So, of course, you can uh, see that uh, the virus and viruses effect can uh, can decrease over time uh, because of the because of its uh, uh, evolutionary process that the virus can become weaker, people's immunity can increase to it, or there might there can be a development of the vaccine. So the the model with vital dynamics is usually uh, having their impact, the most strongest impact in the first few years. And then the number of cases or the number of deaths start to decrease over many years. This hasn't be, doesn't have to be the first few years. It may even increase. I will show you examples sh shortly that may not be the case. But the average behavior is that uh, the vitality of a virus is decreasing over, over years. And uh, the viruses that were uh, storming around the earth uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, are not even known by most people today. And of course, one can complicate uh, uh, as, uh, as much as we want. So you can say that you can put susceptibles, exposed, infected, recovered, and uh, treatment. And you can always include always the mortality so this 
gives a lot of different options if you want to consider how you can build on the model you have from the homework one, for example. If you want to model more complicated real world situation, you cannot always add these parameters and you can have a more complicated model. So you see that here, for example, in this diagram, we have a susceptible uh, population and then they might be exposed to the virus and then uh, they, they might uh, they may go to treatment or they may go to infected from that or they can become infected first and then treated next and uh, they can even be uh, uh, so it doesn't have to be one way these transitions someone could go back to from infected back to susceptible if they have uh, temporary immunity so all these things can play a play a role defend, depending on the specific characteristics of uh, of a virus that is infecting the people another very important side of uh, these kind of uh, disease spreading pandemics is the uh, repeated seasons so most of the the viruses that are connected with influenza are showing their effects with a period uh, with a frequency they they kind of repeat and come again if you can easily see it in in, in uh, countries monthly death uh, population so normal flu or normal influenza is also increasing significantly in certain months uh, how many people that die and this might be particularly high in some years and particularly low in in some years so you see that there are a lot of people that are dying anyway for natural causes but this number is constantly oscillating every year once or twice this is due to the repeated seasons of infection so the virus is for some reason more affected in a certain period of period of time in a year than the rest or two different time periods of a year than the rest and then this results in all these repeated infections and this might be you can see here that, for example, for many years, this has been the, the same pattern over and over again. And you can see that some of them have been significantly stronger. Some of them have been just a regular influenza. These things may depend on the specific conditions of that year, the, the climate and a lot of other external parameters. For example, the, there might be uh, some specific reason that more people got infected. There might be some specific, for example, this year, uh, uh, after, especially after May, a lot of people have been very careful about having a distance from one another. This also results in not only the reduction in the infection coming from the coronavirus, but it also results in the reduction of infection coming from all different viruses that are coming from the influenza family so this actually is beneficial for for the society not only for the coronavirus but also reducing the infection from the other viruses as well of course it also indicates that we have a short term immunity for these kind of viruses or they are evolving fast enough that they can make us sick again that is partly why we need to, if you want to take a vaccine for flu, you essentially need to repeat it every, every year or two. So you need to take it again to be able to be immune for the, for the family of viruses that will cause flu every year, which does not even guarantee that you're not going to get it because uh, it may not cover the, all, the, all the viruses, possible viruses that is around to infect people. And so that uh, from for coronavirus, people are not really uh, acquainted with enough data yet that we can identify this as a repeated season disease yet. But what people what uh, people have seen so far is that uh, the, the 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 plots for different countries look very very similar. So if you check the uh, data of the northern hemisphere countries you see that the initial wave was concentrated around april or may or march depending on the country and then the the second wave started october or november mostly and then the the numbers are increasing once again 
of course, these we hope that are the worst numbers that we are going to see this year. So that uh, either by increased immunity of the population or decreased effectiveness of the virus, or there might be a vaccine coming up. Hopefully that will reduce these numbers dramatically by next year. Of course, these results may change if you are if people are living on a on a different part of the world, especially climate-wise. Most people have observed that maybe there are people from the uh, South America here that they were not so strongly affected in the beginning of the pandemic, although there were cases, but it was not so serious. But it became much more serious over the summer, over the late summer, and then it's still being serious there at the moment. So it really depends on uh, so. Typically, if a, if a virus is more effective in the in one hemisphere in a certain season, it's more effective in the other hemisphere in the opposite because it it is closely related to climate. And this is not for coronavirus case. This is for general influenza cases. And uh, if people are living in a tropical region, it they might actually be affected uh, the whole time because the climate doesn't really change over the year. Although being slightly less effective overall, influenza, it might uh, preserve its effect throughout the whole year because simply because the, the climate is, uh, is very stable. Any questions so far? Yeah, I have a question regarding modeling the diffusion. So in our model, we had a we had a nice grid that was really homogeneous, but uh, did people try to model this, uh, say on a city grid, and then actually try to have the people, you know, go to work or something, so not have the agents move randomly, but uh, you know, sort of try to simulate the actual movement of people. Is that something that is done also? Or yes, that is a very good question. Actually, uh, people need to model if they want to. Uh... So, the, so what we did in the model was something very simple because it was meant to be done in a in a time period of a week. So if you have more time, you can design a transport simulation essentially, which represents more effectively how people move during a day. So people just don't randomly walk and meet each other, but they go to certain places with a purpose. For example, you can assume you can put houses all around the city in your model and then people may need to take certain buses or certain trams certain metro whatever and then they need to even make changes and all these things and then whoever are in the same station or in the same bus they might be able to uh, uh, how you say it they might be able to infect each other a very simple thing you can just add to the so the simulation you have in the in the homework one is that you can assume that every agent have a home, right? This should not be so difficult. Like I have an address of a certain lattice site, and it can be shared by multiple of them. And every day they are associated with a work location or a school. It can be another location in the lattice site, and they have to go from one to the other with a little bit of randomness. So they go from one location to the other, but they also go around a little bit depending on what they want to do in a real day. So this would be something incredibly simple. There is a question on the chat as, as the more advanced model require more parameters and thus more knowledge about the pathogen under study, would you say this is an inherent weakness of these models? that if the pathogen is novel, the model may not work so well after some time. Yes, absolutely. If, if we don't have a, uh, ex have an extended knowledge, still, even today for coronavirus, we are not really sure what is really the time frame. If two people are standing close to each other, what is the time frame that it becomes dangerous that one is going to infect the other with a higher probability? Or what is a what is a certain distance? Of course, we know that uh, the more distant we are, the better, but this research have not been really conducted yet. And there are lots of other things, not only about spreading the virus, regarding the coronavirus or, 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 a, or a new uh, 
pandemic that is coming out, it takes years and years for people to obtain knowledge and uh, even get together the data to, to make some studies. It, it will take a lot of time before people actually understand what was happening and actually write models to explain the observation that has been made. But these things will take a lot of time. But of course, we, we are interested for the case of this course is that how we can increase the accuracy of our model, our simulation. And one easy implementation to what you already have, you can try it yourself, is that you just assign every agent with a home and with a work. They do their random walk in addition to what they are, they are supposed to do. So every day they need to go from one line to the other. The simplest model is that they might be walking. It might be a small town and no, no public transport, whatever. And then people will come across each other. People will meet in schools. People with, will meet at home, everyone. So if one person from a family is infected, this will result in all the family being infected eventually. And you can also, with this way, easily implement the conditions for quarantine. You can dramatically decrease the diffusion coefficient already in your model that you have made. And this will somewhat simulate a condition for a quarantine. But not necessarily. If you have a more complicated model, like every agent is assigned to a home and a school or something like that, or work environment, this will make, uh, uh, in the simplest form, uh, it will make your simulation much more powerful, definitely, but it won't be able to explain what is really happening in a big city. But it's a, I would say it's a like, very big step towards the right direction. So you are not simulating, of course, what's really happening in a big city like Gothenburg, but you are including a lot of parameters that is actually not in the original simulation. Okay, so... Uh, are there more questions about this? And Marco, did my answer answer your question? Uh, yes. Well, I, I'm sort of. I mean, this is, uh, I guess, more of a political question or something. But uh, can we really expect some quantitative results from the simulations? I mean, clearly we have nice qualitative results, and we can see like the general patterns and so on. Yes. But I'm just I mean, wondering, like, is it even possible to have a realistic model or or can we just, go, uh, I mean, in the regard to quantitative results, so quantitative you know, because results people made are, all these predictions and they were really off. So I'm wondering, like, what models did they use? <laughs> I would say the very, very identical results that is coming exactly uh, as a reality of a very novel virus is very difficult. So I expect people to fail, but this should not, of course, uh, uh, like uh, stop people from trying. And uh, it will be, I mean, I don't want to get into anything political. Of course, there are lots of aspects. I will get into later in this class about the economics of uh, governing a pandemic and what might be reasonable or what may not be. But uh, it's another topic. Uh, if uh, the simulations, if you can act on simulations or not, you need to define a confidence parameter of how your simulation is going to reflect the real world. And that you have to de design. This is part of the designing simulations of complex systems, is that you make your model and you compare it to what you already know, what you already observe in the real world. It's, it's not uh, like the data is not non-existent, not non-existent. There is a lot of data you can look and try to understand what's going on. You have the data for a lot of countries that have locked down on a certain period and then open the lockdown, partial lockdown, they opened, they kept for a while. There's a lot of different examples and the, you have a lot of data about what has actually happened as a result of these policies. Of course, there is a lot of also problems that if you can trust on the, on the data that a certain country is providing or not, that's also another point. So it's not even obvious at this point that if the truth and the models are not consistent, it may be the model, but it may also be the truth is actually not the truth we are told to. So it's there is a lot of different parameters, especially for the for the pandemic. So we we may not be ans uh, be able to answer. But our focus here is that how can we model this thing more accurately? So this is what we focus on. What 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 would increase our accuracy of of uh, representing the real world situation? And of course, 
having a real transportation system modeled would be a big plus. That is the answer. But uh, no, okay, this... thanks, thanks. You clarified a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so that's great. We can move forward. So, okay, one way to understand if you want to if this repeated diseases are repeated over a year or every six months. This may depend, depend on the type of the virus and climate, of course, but uh, there's a lot of different diseases and it may actually evolve differently over time. You hear, uh, how many of you are familiar with power spectrums? Not me, sometimes some people wrote. Can you write uh, I am familiar or not in the chat? Okay, a lot of people are not familiar. Okay, I will quickly try to explain what it means. Is what, what a power spectrum means is that uh, it takes, it multiplies uh, the entire function, entire data with a certain sine or cosine frequency and then gets the sum of it. This gives a very small result if, if your function is not oscillating at a certain frequency, it, this, this result gets higher. So what this shows you is that how strong are, the, are your oscillations in your data at certain frequencies. So this allows you to uh, kind of, it's a very common process in signal processing that you uh, uh, put your signal in pieces at different frequencies. And the strength of each frequency is represented by this power spectrum what people called. And uh, you can see that the, this, this periodicity of this number of cases for missiles in the US is changing over time. So it, in the beginning, it was more like a stronger with a year of frequency. And then later it became equally powerful. Yes, somebody asked, is, it, it is, is this related to the Fourier transform? Yes, exactly. Power spectrum is a square up absolute value square of Fourier coefficients, essentially. So that is, uh, if you are familiar with Fourier transform, it's uh, something uh, very closely related to that. So you can see that uh, the, so this is a one way of analyzing a, a pandemic or, or a disease spreading. If, if it is uh, more characteristic, to, to repeat it every half year or a year or at a different frequency. And here, for example, chickenpox in, uh, in Canada, you see that this data is much more related to uh, repetitions in, uh, in a frequency of one year, differently from the messless, which is more like uh, influenza related. Is there any questions about here? Okay, I will move forward to uh, economics of governing a pandemic. This is uh, something I wanted to talk about also that, uh, so we may apply a model that is uh, uh, the disease spreading part. And you can also uh, in parallel, uh, create another model that is interfering the model, original model we have, that is making the major decisions. The model we have so far is that every individual has no conscious, and then they're going around, they become sick, they get recovered, everything goes in a loop that actually has no external controls. So you can create parameters that are controlled by external, external mind. So this, uh, the parameters may consist of how actually you decide to implement distancing between people or how you actually implement the lockdown. This is uh, uh, an issue that a lot of countries, for example, taking different uh, approaches. So there are a few countries who went to total lockdown. Some of them went for a lockdown for work, not for schools, some of them uh, went for partial lockdown in the weekends, some of them went for partial lockdown in the evenings, or lockdown for bars. Uh, a lot of different approaches was made, 
and all of them have, a, have an economic cost. And this economic cost doesn't have to be uh, only related to money that a country will actually, or the, or the growth that, uh, that the country will eventually have. It may actually have a, have a, have a negative impact on people's health as well. So it, people have to consider people, for example, people can argue that this is a matter of people's lives. So we need to lock down everything. And then uh, until the danger is, is passed, this will have a lot of frustrating financial problems that will push a lot of people away from access to health uh, system when they actually need it for other purposes. Or it might even be psychological health problems because of the uh, frustrating economics that result from this hard lockdown, a lot of people will eventually uh, force to lose their jobs, and all these things become integrated into a much bigger problem. So, and this is a very nice paper, actually. I put it uh, in the in the optional readings on the on the lecture folder on the website, so you can go and read and. Uh, they talk about optimal targeted lockdown policies. For, so in order to optimize what would be the most feasible method and when to lock down and on which part of people to lock down. Because this, is, this has been the most important decision parameter for, for, for people who govern the pandemics, especially that came with coronavirus. So some of them may made the accurate timing and the, and the group of people or, or, a, or a targeted lockdown. So this general idea is that a targeted lockdown is, uh, you can see in this plot, that is more optimal than just a uniform lockdown. So it, it results in a, in a decrease of deaths more effectively at a, at a, at a much lower cost. And uh, there is the ideal they show here is simply that the, for the ideal success, you need to have an optimal targeted lockdown. So you need to find the optimal lockdown times. You need to find the optimal target for your lockdown. So what you need to lo make lockdowns for. And then you need to make a, a really, really successfully promote the distancing of people. And then you also need to uh, actively test and uh, successfully trace, uh, trace these people. What is happening with the people that is sick? So if someone is sick, you need to trace what, what that, who that person has been in contact with, test them also, and then put them in a, in, a, in a targeted lockdown. So if someone can successfully apply all these things, one can actually have a uh, very strong control of that with a very small amount of loss. Of course, all of these things are a huge area of research and it has actually been more uh, intense over the last year. And you can, you can search for a lot of these kind of uh, articles online, Google Scholar, and you will see a lot of new research is coming out, especially uh, motivated by the by the situation that the coronavirus brought. So is there any questions here? Yeah, if you are further interested in this one, uh, uh, especially the economic side, uh, I would say uh, I recommend the article that you, that I left in the optional readings that you can read. So of course, uh, in the real world, you see that uh, a lot of people took different uh, decisions for their lockdown. And you can see that a lot of countries have different kind of uh, 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 numbers and outcomes. So it's very difficult to say or conclude that this was successful and this was not. And these things will be maybe able to determine over the far future while people will be able to analyze all these data and understand what really happened in each and every country and uh, to, to maybe conclude what was successful and what was not. Actually, yeah, so the, uh, a lot of things also may depend on the final outcome. So we don't really know. A lot of 
uh, countries were judged by, by the first wave of the coronavirus and its results, but the overall success of the country at the end will eventually be uh, decided on the number of the final outcome, both economically and, and health-wise. So it's actually very difficult to say when is the ideal time to get make the decision that that we we introduce a lockdown now or we introduce this kind of lockdown on this kind of people population so all these different measures can lead to different outcomes and it's uh, it's uh, it would be a very nice study also to change like these strategies in a model and try to come up with an ideal lockdown strategy. And there is actually a lot of research going on. A lot of people are working on this. What should be the optimal lockdown strategy? Because this is the most important decision when people are governing a pandemic. So this is the, what was the right hand figure on the last slide? So this is a general SIR model and it it is uh, so the, the the orange bar is in when people increase a lockdown and it is actually a not a permanent lockdown a partial lockdown so they 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 introduce a lockdown for a very short period of time and you see that these dashed lines uh, that are uh, orange and uh, dashed blue and dashed green are the results if there were no lockdowns. And the, the, the results that you see in, uh, in the solid lines are the final outcomes. And you see that, that final number of recovered people is seeing a significant reduction with a partial lockdown. More importantly, this results in a much lower maximum infected people at the time step. So partial lockdowns are very important for, for so this, this is an example, let's say, how can I explain this in a very uh, intuitive way? So this is, you can see that the drop from the dashed green line to the solid green line at the end is not a huge drop. So it will not change if you make a very short lockdown, it will not change very dramatically a number of final outcome but you may prevent your health system from uh, collapsing because you keep the maximum number of sick people at a certain limited level so this is uh, important for that strategy i hope this answers the question and actually this is a uh, the last thing I want to talk about is that you can also uh, get help from uh, from machine learning to to uh, create a strategy that would make optimum lockdown. And you can always try uh, reinforcement learning and train a neural network to create simulations and uh, make uh, a system that may uh, train with simulated or real data in order to decide in uh, and make decisions about when and uh, on whom to make lockdown decisions. So this can also be made with machine learning and actually Laura Natali from our research group uh, is working on this thing. I, I, I borrowed this slide from her and uh, so it is also possible to study uh, optimal lockdown strategies using machine learning because they they are they have been shown to be good in these kind of tasks that are difficult to parameterize. Is there any questions related to this slide? Okay, this was actually the 
last slide. So if you have any questions related to the rest of the lecture, you can ask or about homework one or two. Okay, great. Then uh, this would be all for today's lecture. And uh, uh, you can uh, you can leave the lecture if you want now. Thank you. Hey, um, I, I wanted to talk about uh, a meeting. Yes. Which group are you from? Uh, I'm from group five. And we haven't decided the time yet for you, right? No, I, I sent a mail yesterday. I think I'm not sure you have received it. I am pretty sure I've received it, but uh, yesterday we were checking homeworks all day, and I have uh, been having lectures and meetings all morning now. Okay. But you will get uh, a time. Don't worry. Okay, but um, I, I'm not sure, like if we were late or if we were like on time or. No, no, you were you were on time. Don't worry okay. about it. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, uh, great. And uh, I'll see you later. Okay. Perfect. Bye. Bye.